now and here we go i am recording uh tony welcome it is good meeting you for the audience can you share a little bit about yourself and what you do yeah tommy lee thanks for having me here man um i am a uh an ex disney animator but i've been in animation uh for the last oh gosh almost 30 years now started at disney uh, went to school for animation and have owned my own animation company and now i'm teaching teaching animation at a university yeah hey let me ask you how did you get started on this did you knew that you wanted to do this when you were younger how, what was your journey to this part i did i have a twin brother just like you do i know and um and tom and i uh grew up loving to draw so and we were competitive with it just like some brothers are with throwing a football or playing soccer or something like that we were competitive with our drawings literally iron sharpens iron right mm -hmm. as we know the good word says that and so we were always constantly over each other's shoulders like oh don't do that try this and oh this would be funnier and you know and doing gag drawings and comic strips and we loved um like uh schultz uh, P uh charles schultz peanuts characters yeah. and we used to draw calvin hobbs we thought we wanted to do comic strips at first and then yeah, kind of morphed okay. into animation wow okay okay and so and then from that point on how did you get started at disney like people would sit there i love to draw but to get to disney is like the the epic yeah i mean it was uh it, it wasn't easy back then but it was definitely easier for us i think in the you know uh late 80s early 90s was a good time to get into disney um there was a lot of transition transition happening uh, actually when we got into animation my brother and i we went to cal arts california institute of the arts which is a university that disney had the company and the family disney started that company or started that university and we went there studied animation and that was a great inroad for us to get into Disney. So just, yeah. we started into an internship, like right from there. Yeah, yeah, in your first job at Disney, did you start drawing characters right away? What, what did you do when you first started Disney? Yeah, both Tom and I were hired specifically for um, very beginning role. Uh, in the old days of traditional, like hand-drawn animation, like you see in flip books and things like that, yeah. going all the way back to like when Walt Disney was alive and Snow White and all that, we still were animating that way in the 90s. Wow. So the beginning position for that kind of animation, not computer animation, but hand-drawn animation, is called an in-betweener. And you're literally yeah. drawing those in-between drawings to fill out an action that's done by the animator. So we work you know, underneath an animator who's kind of our mentor, and we do all the in-between drawings to make fuller, fuller Disney-quality animation. And that's how we started. But it was in Florida, Orlando, Florida. They had oh. just started a brand new studio there, and Tom and I were like, employees number six and seven or something of this brand oh, new okay. studio. There was also a tour too. So many people probably growing up took tours through that animation studio that was part of the Disney MGM Studios theme park, which was an actual theme park there in Orlando. Uh, yeah, man. And then through that, I, I know you, which uh, movies have you, you, I know you've done Mulan, you've done Lion King. Which other ones have you done here, Tony? Uh, Beauty and the Beast, um, Aladdin, um yeah a lion king what else rescuers down under yeah. worked on uh for sony i went over there and i worked on Stuart little two um and emperor's new groove at disney you mentioned mulan i co-directed that yeah. yeah i started out in animation and then moved up into directing and supervising then i started my own animation company soon after i left disney no, Tony, yeah. I I, I have a four-year-old daughter. My wife is five months pregnant. Wow. And my whole life these days with my four-year-old daughter is princesses. Everything <laughs> about princesses. And so I know she'll probably want me to ask you, what was it like? Like, what character were you over at Beauty and the Beast or Lion King? Well, I always did the comedy characters. Um, just like in live action, a director, actually in those days in the 90s, directors would cast animators based on their skill sets. And I was really good with comedy. I always loved to do comedy. And so I was kind of typecast, if you will, as a comedy guy. So on Beauty and the Beast, I did Cogsworth the Clock. On yes. Aladdin, on Aladdin, I did Yago the Parrot, you know, the screeching yes. parrot. And then on uh, Lion King, I did Pumbaa, Emperor's New Groove, I did Kronk. Um, so they were always the they were always the funny characters. But I love that because you get a reaction from the audience. You know, they either they either laugh or they don't, right? 
Got it. Now, when you say you did the characters, did you do the voices and the drawing or just the drawing the animation portion? Oh, yeah, just the animation. So just anything you saw visually of the character, I animated those things. Um, and we do have a team, too. I did, it's not like I did it all by myself. Animation is such a Herculean effort. It takes. It's a very time-consuming thing to do. It's like watching paint dry, but with drawings. And um, so it really takes a lot of time. So on, like on Beauty and the Beast on Cogsworth, I was one of three or four animators that actually drew that character and animated that character. But yeah, there was a different voice altogether. And Tony, at least a little, when I see those back, uh, those behind the scenes videos and to do one animation has so many different scenes in there. How many years does it take just to do a whole movie? Yeah. Disney could take um, up to four years to make an animated feature. So we don't know that because they were, you know, especially in the 90s, they were popping out one every year, right? They would come out at Christmas time or summertime. And, um, but they're overlapped. That's how they do it at the big studios is they have several productions going on at the same time, always overlap, just like, you know, airplanes on a a tarmac getting ready to take off. They're just like cycling them through. Let's talk a little bit about Mulan, which you co-wrote, because you, what was that experience like? You had to research China, understand Asian culture. Talk about your experience uh, co-directing Mulan. Yeah, it was, that was an awesome experience, but it was also one of the most terrifying times of my life because I had never directed before and Disney tapped me to be the co-director on this big Asian film. I didn't, when I started on Mulan, I didn't know who she was. I didn't know much about, hardly anything about Asian culture, never been to China. And all that changed in the next couple of years because I was on it for about, I was on that for about four years too. And, um, but I went to, I went to, um, you know, Hong Kong. We, there was, there was no real internet at the time. So we had a lot of books and photographs. There was a trip there to China, mainland China, taking photographs, meeting people. We actually hired some artists that were Chinese that came in and work specifically on that so that we can have an understanding of the, the Chinese dynamic for painting and, and composition. And it was a really a deep dive uh, into Chinese culture and, and elements of Chinese history too. When you look back at Mulan, what was it that you were trying to communicate to the audience? What did you want them to experience and see as it related to Mulan, the characters? That's a great question. I mean, for us, it was, it was a matter of pride. We, we knew we were Westerners telling a very ancient Chinese story, a, chi- a story that was really important to uh, China too. This is like their Paul Bunyan, like what Paul Bunyan is to the U S even more so Mulan is to China. I mean, that's their kind of a national treasure, a story that kids are brought up with over the years uh, since for thousands of years, to tell you the truth, she goes back um, over 2000 years. So for us, we knew that we had to get it right. And getting it right meant, like I said, deep diving into the culture, into the history, making sure that if we had a pot or, um, you know, a a hanging on the wall or something like that, even props that were in the scene, that they were accurate, costuming and all that. We did extensive research. We wanted not only the story to work on a Western level, but on on a Eastern level, an Asian level, we wanted it to be accurate. We wanted it to be reverent to, um, to uh, their history, to their culture, as much as possible. Even to the point where we had a scene where, in the movie, currently there's a scene where, um, currently, and that's the only scene that's, that, that exists, <laughs> this is the current one. Um, but there's a scene where Mulan actually leaves and she takes this transcript, uh, this kind of scroll thing uh, from her father's bedside and she gets on the horse and she leaves for the army. Well, in that very scene where she comes into the, to the, her mom and dad's room and they're sleeping, we used to have it in the storyboards, which was more of a Western sensibility. She used to lean over and kiss, kiss her uh, father on the cheek. Yeah. And then she took the conscription notice and left. Well, our Chinese uh, artists were like, oh, no, 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 that's not right. That's not cultural. You know, that wouldn't necessarily happen. There's not that kind of uh, intimacy between father and daughter in, in Chinese culture. So yeah. Even though it meant something to us emotionally in the yeah. West, we thought, you know, a, a daughter giving a, uh, his daughter, a daughter giving his, her father a kiss would be really heartwarming, but it wasn't really culturally relevant. So we, we changed that scene to be her just kind of turning back as she's leaving, giving him a, a real loving look and then turning and going. And so there wasn't that physic, physicality to it. Tony, that makes a very, a very key point. On a side note, also, it teaches us a lot about in, uh, global missions, doesn't it? Yeah. 
a lot of times when Americans from the Western world go to a certain countries, they don't respect the culture, they don't honor the culture, they don't learn about the culture, and they go in with their Western mindset and infuse that as they work on global missions. Yeah, Tommy, that's a great point because, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of U.S. directors, even in that moment of directing that scene, that would probably go, well, you know, I don't, you know, I don't care what the, what the Chinese would do here. This doesn't make sense for our audience. So we're going to, we're going to have her give them a kiss. You know, that, that has meaning. That's going to get some tears going and they just go for the end result. But for us, like I said, we, we want it. If you have that desire in your heart, which is what we did our whole team from day one with Mulan, we had this desire that we want to be culturally relevant. We want to be as accurate as possible. We want to bend over backwards to try and make sure that we don't try and change this story into what we think it should be, but we try and tell it from as much their perspective that we have the ability to do. And you're right. I think so many times that we go to different territories, different countries, um, just as people or believers, oftentimes we think, well, we do it better back here. So you guys should change to meet to suit my feelings and my needs and my, my philosophies and what I grew up with, you know, that I'm comfortable with. And it's such a, such a, I think a horrible way to go into a relationship. I think you should always go into a relationship going, well, how to trying to understand how they think, how they understand, how they do business, how they operate uh, emotionally and all that. And then trying to adapt your own thinking there too. Like for instance, Tony, I grew up with, uh, as Asian American, yeah. my parents have never said, I love you to this day. Never even heard that in my life. Wow. Do I know my parents love me? Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, but an American mind, but they've never said, I love you. But it's the whole culture. It's how they work. It's how they live their life. They never had to say those words and they never will. But it's also how they treated me growing up. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know what? That could work for many, many, many families in, in China. For us in, you know, in the West, we don't understand yeah. that. It seems wrong. It seems broken. There's, that needs to be fixed. You know, we, we, get, we get emotional about it, wanting to change that. You've you got to get your parents to say, I love you. you know? But like you said, you felt loved. They showed you in their own ways that they loved you. By, you know, a, a man in China shows his love oftentimes by, by just being diligent about doing his business and bringing home a paycheck and supporting his family. And, and that's an understanding that goes back, you know, hundreds and thousands of years. And that's a role, right? And so you have to kind of understand those roles go back way back, way, way back. And that's an understanding that's developed that we can't understand because we've just had it different our whole, our whole life, you know? As you reflect upon Mulan right now, after all these years, is there a scene, is there a situation in the movie that you look back in that you're really, really proud of that really, that you just want to brag about and say, man, that sticks out to me. Well, I was, you know, I had one daughter that was born um, on Lion King. So right before Mulan. And then I had another daughter that was born while I was making Mulan. And then I ultimately have three daughters now. So another one was born after Mulan. So being a, creating a, a female heroine, a female role model for not only my kids, but other, other girls as they grew up, and particularly a Chinese role model. I can't tell you how many Chinese fathers, I remember once in particular, a Chinese father coming up to me and saying, I watched Mulan with my daughter because I didn't know how to show her and say to her that I wanted her to be all that she could be and that I loved her. And that relationship between Fazu and Mulan, you know, the father and daughter, and that was so helpful for us to be able to watch that together on the big screen. So I want to thank you for making me a better Chinese father, you know, and, and I got teary. I got, I, you know, I started to well up just thinking about that, that this animated cartoon that we produced at Disney could have that kind of impact that it brought fathers and daughters together or, or helped a father to sit, tell her daughter, tell his daughter, you can do anything that you've set your mind to, just like Mulan. You can achieve, you know, greatness. Um, and that is there for you if you want it. And I'm, I'm there to support you in it. You know, um, those kind of impactful moments are huge. But my favorite moment in the film is definitely that father-daughter dynamic and that scene at the very end when she comes home 
after saving all of China and the emperor rewards her with Shan Yu's sword and this pendant and everything. And she brings that to her father and when he's sitting there in the garden area of their backyard and he's, she's like, this is for this and this is for this. And he just takes it all and drops it to the ground and says, you know, you're the only thing that matters to me. You're the greatest pride prize and reward. I'm just paraphrasing that, you know, you, you mean the world to me and not this stuff. That for me, I still get teared up when I hear Soon Tech O, the actor that portrayed the father, say those lines. And it was like, that's the core of it for me. You know, that's what that movie was. Yeah. What about the other characters? As you look back at all the movies that you've worked with and you just recently did Mary Poppins. Yeah. What sticks out? What what were some of the fun moments, uh, highlights in your life as you worked on these projects? Well, Lion King was a huge... uh, a huge great memory for me because I, I was that was my first time becoming a supervising animator and at Disney that means that I was like the lead animator on a character and they gave me the character Pumbaa the warthog on the Lion King again a comedy character I was loving it but also my best friend a guy named Mike Surrey was the animator of Timon and we yeah. shared an office and we were like Pumbaa and Timon we really were we already had that relationship and we were buddies and we we played off of each other and, you know, um, we were just like Pumbaa and Timon already. And so for us to have him, Timon, and me, Pumbaa, and work together in the same office for about, I would say we worked on it for about eight or nine months just doing the animation of those two characters. That was one of the most memorable times I'll never forget. Yeah. Tony, let me switch gears a little bit and a little, talk a little bit about your faith. Yeah. As a Christian, if someone says to you, how do you integrate your faith as you design, as you animate it? How did you integrate your faith even as you led and supervised all these animators? What would you say? How does your faith play a role in all these things? Well, like everybody, and and no matter what you do in the professional world or just in society in general, you know, how you live your life is a testament to Christ in you and the light that you can be. And I always felt like, um, because I, I've had people like from my church and say, how can you work for Disney? It's a secular company and they do this and they do that and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, well, they're a business like any business, like the business you work for, the business he works for and she works for. They're a business like anybody that's out after the almighty dollar, right? But they're also a business and a place where there's darkness and we need light in those places. So I felt a calling early on as a young Christian that anima- not only did God give me a skill set for drawing and, um, and creating stories and that sort of thing and characters, but he also gave me this feeling of, I need to be a light in a dark place. And, and in this world of entertainment and animation specifically, I knew that I could shine. So how does that play out? Well, on Mulan and directing Mulan, I had a lot of say and authority because I'm now a co-director. So I'd worked up the chain. Um, and so I, I had the ideas that were that are not only still ongoing, but um, you know things that were very relevant uh, back then in her time period. So, you know, how do we play with that in the story that we give cultural relevance, historical relevance to those are the way that is the way that the characters think and how they perform and how they operate are all based on this filial piety of trying to bring respect and honor to their family and their ancestors. But we tried to find a way to make kind of not make fun of it, but make light of it. You know, our, our ghosts of the ancestors are like some crazy raucous, you know, party of people coming together like a crazy family reunion or a town hall meeting. And so it's very comical. That's how we play it. We don't play it as like, this is how you should think. We don't get on a soapbox and start preaching about, you know, uh, Buddhism and all the the principles, we could have gone that way. I mean, other directors probably would have because they would say, oh, this is, this is really what we want to showcase. This is what we want to put attention on or a spotlight. And instead, because myself and my co-director, Barry Cook, were believers, we took a different way of, of approaching it. Let's make it more about the characters. Let's make it yeah. more about, this is just, you know, culturally relevant. This is just what was happening um, as opposed to, you know, lots of prayer sessions and how the ancestors were helping her and all this kind of stuff. And I don't know, we, there's, that's a big, actually, that's a big point where 
I had an influence on a film at Disney as a Christian. Yeah. And there's, then there's all these other smaller things too. I remember working on Emperor's New Groove and there was a storyboard of Kronk. Uh, you know, Kronk has the, the devil and angel that pop up on his shoulder. They're like his conscience, right? And they're funny characters and stuff. But the devil character <laughs> like did this like, you know, kind of devil uh, like a sign that you see at like rock shows, you know, heavy metal shows where everybody yeah. sticks their hand up in the air and they make this devil sign. And at one point on the storyboards, he did that. And I told the director, I said, and, and this is not me going, standing on a pedestal saying, I'm a Christian and I don't believe in this and I don't think we should do. It was just me coming to them and, and, and talking to them as somebody that has some common sense and saying, you know, we're trying to market this as a family film and, you know, middle America, the Bible Belt, would be offended by an action like that. They would see that as kind of a satanic gesture. Whereas, you know, some people just see it as kind of cool or whatever. They don't really put a spiritual spirituality connected to that symbol. Um, I said, but, but that would be offensive to others. And so maybe there's another way we should do this. And, and after the director considered it, he said, yeah, let's just have them, you know, do like a fist pump or something like, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, and that's what we changed it to. And that's what's in the movie. That's a very small little moment in, in an overall picture. But as Christians, we can influence things, even, even to that minutia, that will resonate and uh, will have an impact overall. Yeah, yeah. Like animation in general, how do you see it evolving? Like right now, you're a professor, you're teaching. Yeah. Are you teaching students something different than what you learn? Or how has animation evolved over a period of time? Well, technology has involved, uh, evolved over time, and that's really influenced animation and the course of animation. The principles and how, we, how you basically approach animation hasn't changed. I mean, it goes back to Walt Disney's time in the early 20s. But it has gotten more sophisticated, and technology is now built into that too. So now there's computer animation and digital animation. And so a lot of the tool sets that we use are more on the computer than on pencil and paper. That's very rare that we actually draw pencil and paper anymore. Um, although I will say that Mary Poppins returns. I just worked on that, yeah. which is out right now. And we did all that paper and pencil because we wanted it to look like that traditional animation of the first Mary Poppins, you know? Got it, got it, got it. Uh, you, you mentioned something that caught my attention. You, when you start animating a character, what goes into understanding a character? And the reason being is, how does that inform you even now as you look at scripture and you look at David, Joseph, Jesus, Peter, how does your mind as an animator inform you as you look at scripture? <laughs> That's funny because, I, yeah, I do. I mean, I think of characters, um, you know, and, and Christ was a, was a great storyteller too. And I love that, uh, that we have that in our roots, you know, that we have that, that he's given us all this ability to, and understanding that we connect with stories and we connect with characters. And so the Bible is, is, is laced with all these wonderfully larger than life characters that, that we read and learn from and enjoy. Um, and for me, I, tr when I'm, when I get a script and say it's beauty and the beast or, um, or Lion King, and I'm looking at Pumbaa for the first time, it's just dialogue on a page at that point. So I'm starting to think about what is his physicality? You know, he's a, he's a big fat guy basically, but he's also a, you know, a warthog, a pig. So I'm trying to make humanize him and take, take elements of his design and, and kind of make him more humanized so that audiences can connect with him in a deeper way, but also trying to hold on to what makes him uniquely a warthog and an animal too, a quadruped. So I'm studying animal reference for how, you know, warthogs walk and run and how they use their tails and how they, you know, turn their heads and things like that. I, I, I'm studying their, their arc, their, uh, their bone structure and their muscles and the muscle groups and what yeah. makes them move and how they tick. So I get down to that minutia, but then I'm also looking at what, who is the character of Pumba? not only the voice, but you know, what is his role? He's basically like a big you know, football player, jock, you know, this is how the, the directors pitched Puma and Timon to me and Mike Suri was these guys are like bachelors. They're like, you know, in college together, they're hanging out. They don't want, you know, girls or relationships tying them down. They're just slobs that live in their dorm room and have fun and have raucous kind of parties, you know? So that was like, <laughs> that was the overall like picture of Puma and Timon. Now you put that, those characters into a world of, Africa and the jungle and 
all of a sudden you have a Hakuna Matata lifestyle yeah. that erupts, you know? Yeah. Tony, apply, I mean, what, what are some of those principles for people who are listening to this as they look at scripture? What are some principles that you would share from your role as a designer? When we look at scriptures and look at characters, mm-hmm. what are some things that we can learn from what you're doing as we apply it? Well, I think, you know, um, for me, uh, I always looked at my characters as, um, as vehicles of expressing a story. And I think that's the main thing that I get from the Bible and from the characters of the Bible, all the apostles, and all the different characters that are in the Bible, is that they have a way of telling, they're telling a larger story. And so are we. And this is where it comes back to, to me as a person and as a believer is that I believe that God has made me a character in a larger role to play, in a larger story that is playing out for his kingdom and his kingdom glory. And I believe that that my role to play is uniquely different from everybody else's. So just as I put a lot of work and effort into a character like Pumbaa to make him unique from Timon and the other characters, God has made us unique also. He's given us not only a different voice, but also a different physicality, a different um, life, different talents and abilities. And he wants us to go out into the world and play out and be the character that he has designed us to be. Just like I designed Pumbaa to be, he's this rotund guy, but he's also strong and he's kind of a jock and he's kind of messy and all that goes into his personality traits, goes into the design and look of the character. God has us, you know, uniquely made and we are beautiful in his eyes. And I know that the world tries to tell us all the time that we're not, that we we're ugly or we're not fit enough or we're not whatever enough. But, you know, as a bald, heavy set guy myself, I can say that God made me and sees me as a beautiful thing, a beautiful, um, a beautiful creation. And he's made me unique so that I can go out and play a part in his larger story for his kingdom good. Wonderful. Hey, last thing before we wrap up, I see all of those different things right behind you. I see Mickey yeah. Mouse. Can you grab a couple and share a little story about uh, what those may mean to you? Sure. Let's see. Uh, what do I have around here? I do, I, you know, I, I do a lot of uh, drawing on social media. And if uh, cool. anybody wants to be an animator, an artist, they can check me, check out my work on, I'm on Instagram. I post drawings all the time, little doodles like this Mickey Mouse ink drawing that I just Very did. Nice. And um, I'm on, I'm Pumba Guy, P-U-M-B-A-A. There's two A's in Pumba. Pumba Guy on Instagram come check me out. But I, I got um, like, this is an ink drawing I did of, of the audience can't see this, but <laughs> of Mickey Mouse. And I'm a huge fan of Mickey. There's, there's an old classic. I'm holding up a model sheet so you can see it, Tommy, yeah. um, of Mickey. This is from like, like the 1940s. And there was an animator named Freddie Moore, who was not a believer, but he did such an excellent job of really getting a lot of appeal in the design of Mickey. And so I've, I've always tried to kind of emulate his design style because Mickey is just like we all change as we, all, you know, grow and mature designs of characters grow and change too. So Mickey is totally different now than what he started out to be. But I, I have certain phases of different characters that I like more than others. Um, and then I do my own little things. Like I do like, this is like a little, uh, a little mushroom gnome character that I created. I like a little fantasy characters sometimes too. Um, but you know, I, I always try and have some kind of like, you know, spiritual understanding of who this character is, my own backstory, I guess, that I create as I do these little doodles. Wow. Tony, thank you very much. I mean, last thing for those who are aspiring actors or not animators who want to go into design, what's your word encouragement now, especially in this industry, people want to be what you are, want to work for Walt Disney, Pixar. What's your word encouragement for that? Yeah. I mean, there, we need more Christians, I believe, in this animation industry. Um, but first and foremost, you have to be excellent. And I really believe that God created us as, as uh, Christians and as, as his tools and as uh, characters in this larger story. And he wants us to be excellent at what we do. Not mediocre, not halfway. So I think anybody who wants to get into animation, Christian or not, you got to really study. you got to really get dig deep into animation. There's great universities out there to go to, but start drawing first. Draw every day. Just like a football player throws a football, the pigskin every day, and it makes him a better you know, quarterback or whatever. Um, 
animation and drawing uh, needs that kind of attention too. draw every day in a sketchbook. That's the beginning. Draw animals, draw people. Don't just draw cartoon characters or copy, 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 do your own things. And then you grow as an artist and then find a university, brick and mortar university, probably. And I, you know, I'm working at Azusa Pacific university. It's a Christian college. Um, I'm happy to say, so I'm able to talk about my faith with the students, but also teach them about animation and what a career in animation looks like. Um, and so check out Azusa Pacific university. That'd be great. Yeah. And then your podcast for those who are interested in the podcast that you and your brother do. My twin brother and I, Tom, also worked at Disney for over 12 years, too. So we have a podcast that we do called the Bancroft Brothers and Animation Podcast. It's on iTunes and, and iHeartRadio and Spotify. You can find it kind of all over. We're streaming on, on the Internet also. We have over 110 episodes that we've done. And we interview people. from. I love hearing people's stories, just like you, Tommy. Um, now, they're not all Christians, but we do have a couple that, episodes on faith. Um, we have one in yeah. particular about Glenn Keane, who's like a rock star of animation. And he's a really deep, deep believer in God and has been for, for many years. And he talks about his faith in creating beasts from Beauty and the Beast and all these different characters that he's created over the years. I really recommend, maybe that's a starting point, check out yeah. Glenn Keane um, episode, an interview that Tom and I did with him on the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast. You got it. Hey, thanks for your time, Tony. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Nice seeing you, man. We'll catch up soon. Okay. All right.